We can't kill him. He didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, he wasn't stupid like the others. We should just let him go. But I don't really care. Sure. And let him keep his stuff. Keep his stuff? But, but it's magic. Tales from my D&D campaign. So the campaign starts in a dwarf city called Corso's Chasm, on the edge of the desert full of dangerous orcs. Now, in terms of how the party got together and met, Black and Draven were traveling a long way from their human homeland of Vistria with a dwarven trade convoy, and along the way the convoy was attacked by huge mutated bears, or something, and Angel and Little One happened to be nearby, and they all saved the caravan, then traveled the rest of the way to the chasm together. Because meat at the end was too cliché, but only about 10% too cliché. Anyhow, first thing that happens, there's an incident at the mine outside of town, and the accident turns out to be an underground attack by Dark Elves from another dimension! And the party goes through and fights them in their own mine in the Shadowfell. And they kick all kinds of sneaky drow ass, and Angel scouts out a room with a bunch of guards and a drow wizard behind a deep chasm, and Little One was like, Can Angel ride on my shoulders? And Angel was like, Do it! So Angel goes piggyback, and Little One leaps over the gap, and as he lands, Angel and her spike chain launch off his back like a little whirling ball of death, cutting down the minions while Little One plows through, trying to reach the enemy caster, and the wizard dumps like half her memorizations to escape. So they travel deeper into the mines, and they get the Goatmen miners, who are slaves, to help them lure the boss drow guy out, and he turns out to be a huge dickhead with a scythe, and all his multi-class trickery powers, and after doing a bunch of damage and making them all waste attacks on his mirror image and his trickery domain duplicate, he almost traps Black with him to fight one-on-one -on -one in a narrow passageway, but Black manages to finish him off with a crit before he can escape, and now they are heroes to the Goatmen. And then they go back to get the dwarf guards to guard the entrance to the drow mine in the other plane so that they can wall it off, like spackle over the dimensional portal or something. And they go back to town, and the local feudal dwarf lord, Don Di Corso, is like, thanks so much, here's a bunch of gold, and maybe I have a quest for you? So Don Di Corso shows off that he has this magic spoon, and it's just like one of those spoons that makes healthy, nutritious, really bland food, like out of thin air, except normally those things make enough each day to feed six people, maybe? But this spoon is actually an artifact that has no daily limit, except for how fast you can trigger the power, so it can actually feed like 2,000 people, which would be awesome back in Vistria, where they're cut off from most trade, and have a ton of refugees, so starvation is kind of a big problem up there. And De Corso is like, I have a line on two more of these artifacts, and once I've got them all together, I'm hoping you can take them to Vistria for me. I know it's a long, dangerous journey, but if the other two spoons are as good as this one, his voice breaks a little, and you could swear there's a tear in his eye. This is what it's all about, people. This is the chance to make a fortune being heroes. And I don't mean the glory or the fame. I mean genuinely helping people, saving thousands of people from starvation, improving their quality of life. In a way, it's even helping the war effort against the evil empire. And we can be rich. And they're all like, yeah, that's a pretty good sales pitch. Okay. And the Don is like, I've already arranged a business deal for the second spoon with this guy called Bob. So you just go do this easy FedEx mission, and my steward should return with the third spoon by the time you get back. So this totally isn't one of those three-part adventure things. And they're like, good, because those are annoying and way too predictable. So after they've agreed and they're about to ride out to trade the contents of a little chest for the second spoon, De Corso's magistrate comes out and he's like, by the way, I don't want to trouble you or make you worried about the deal or anything, and this really shouldn't be a big deal because the Don and his steward have dealt with Bob several times before and he's totally legit, but I thought I should just mention this little detail, it should not be a problem, but some people get uptight about these things and, and, and they're all like, spill it. And the magistrate is like, technically Bob is a Kuatoa, and they're all like, she it. Those of you who are paying attention may have noticed I mentioned an evil empire earlier. Well, in this world there is a powerful ancient aquatic civilization who have crazy alchemical technology and a way bigger defense budget than all the land nations combined because they rule practically the whole entire ocean and everyone is scared of them conquering the world. And they are these guys, the Kuatoa. 
these Kuatoa have found a way to cheaply mass-produce alchemical invisibility cloaks powered by their own chemical skin secretions so that all their soldiers have them, and yet if you steal their cloaks, they don't work for anyone else. And if invisible armies of amphibious fish guys with masterwork weapons plus legions of expendable, though non-amphibious, aquatic slave races isn't dangerous enough, they also have these warrior monks called monitors. And you may be thinking, don't monks suck in 3rd ed D&D, but trust me, these guys have well-deserved reputation in the setting, like every single man or woman who has stood their ground. Everyone who has fought a monitor has died. If you see a monitor, you run. So wait, why does the Don have a business arrangement with the evil Deluvian Empire? Well, actually, he doesn't. See, the reason the Kuatoa haven't already conquered all the land nations is that 300 years ago they had a huge civil war, which is still going on. A group who called themselves the Illud staged a bloody coup and took over the eastern half of the ocean, and two of the five monasteries came with them. These Illud rebels did a whole bunch of crazy things like change the state religion so they worshipped a neutral god of weather instead of Blibail, the Diluvian goddess. And, you know, god of storms and slaughter and crazy Aztec-style slave sacrifices and eternal war on everybody. And the old empire, the Diluvians, were like, what the fudge? And so they've been locked in a conflict combining elements of a civil war, World War I, and World War II for like 300 years. See, the coastline of the Dwarven nation borders on both of the KT factions, the Diluvians and the Illud. And since the Dwarves' shipping gets attacked all the time by the evil Diluvians, they have, reluctantly, become trading partners with the Illud rebels, trading Dwarven steel for food, luxury goods, and military advisors who help them to protect their ships. But even the Dwarves don't actually like dealing with Kuatoa, and other races tend to like it even less, because nobody's really sure if the Illud are like the neutral empire, or just a very slightly less evil empire, because they still have slavery on a massive scale. But anyway, the party had already agreed to do the easy FedEx quest, and the Don had given them money and horses, and there's going to be a huge payoff when they get all three spoons back to Vistria. Plus, Draven and Black are pretty keen on this whole save humans from starving plan, so they're all like, fine, fine, whatever. And they did check the cargo to make sure they weren't trading, like, yellow cake uranium or something to the KTs. It turns out the thing they are trading is just a little magic rod that can do, like, 3d6 non-lethal electrical damage as a touch attack twice per day. So it's pretty much just a taser. I mean, technically you could call it a weapon, but it hardly seems like a big deal. So the meeting spot is like 10 days away. They get about halfway there when they have this weird random encounter where this strange white deer, and I don't mean like a white deer, I mean like chromatic white, so uniformly white and without shadows that it looks like two-dimensional deer, leads them away from the road to this clearing in the forest and then it disappears into a little white sapling. And I mean really white, like two-dimensional white sapling. And while they are trying to figure out what to do with it, and they're all like, um, hello, bizarre white tree spirit, whatever. Did you call us here for a reason or what? And then they hear these buzzsaw sounds and this, like, huge lumbering thing. And yes, I mean lumbering in every possible sense of the word, as in a massive slow-moving thing that cuts lumber. This 15-foot-tall Warforce robo-lumberjack chops down a row of trees with its buzzsaw arm, then uses its 12-foot-long adamantine tri-bladed greatsword-looking arm to cut each log into four planks and put them in a neat pile. And they all look back down at the little white tree, and they're like, oh, now I get it. Now, they're all, like, level six or something, but as much as Little One loves to smash things, even he isn't really keen to attack the giant metal man who cleaves foot-thick trees like a buzzsaw through butter. So they're all like, hey, Draven, you like machines and magical metal crap, you talk to him. And Draven's like, hello, huge Warforged guy, uh, what's up? And, like, where did you come from? Because aren't Warforged in this world supposed to be mostly extinct and stuff? And the Lumberjack is like, I became active yesterday. My purpose is to cut down all the trees in a predetermined grid of forest, and when I finish, I deactivate myself for 50 years to allow them to grow back. And Draven's like, wow, that is so incredibly efficient. I bet whatever dwarf owns this land is like the happiest lumber baron in all dwarfdom. Well, if you deactivate yourself every cycle, do you have like a manual override, like an external on-off switch? And the lumberjack is like, no, that would be silly. <laughs> Draven breaks up laughing. He's like, it's true. It's so true. Now, they aren't sure just how intelligent, or more to the point, sentient this lumberjack thing is. See, the Warforged are a race which was artificially created by an ancient civilization to fight in some long-forgotten war. They are a type of semi-alive golems. Normally, they are humanoid and about human-sized, and they are considered to be as sentient as you or I. But historically, larger ones are often their more primitive ancestors and tend to be less intelligent, you know, have less of a sense of self. Especially ones like the lumberjack here, who doesn't even have prehensile hands. 
But since they can't think of anything to do other than attack the giant metal monster, or let it trample the little white tree spirit whatever, Draven flat out asks the thing, If you continue on your current path, you threaten this tree spirit whatever, which is a sentient being. Could you possibly just adjust your path to avoid harming it? And the lumberjack looks down at the tiny white sapling that looks side to side and kind of awkwardly shuffles sideways in the clearing, walks past the sapling, shuffles back into his line, double checks his bearings, and starts cutting his way forward again, moving away from the little tree. And they're all like, hooray, we saved the thingy, I guess. But a little white dot floats up from the sapling, a little two-dimensional looking white seed or something. And as Draven looks simultaneously amazed, intrigued, and a little disturbed, it glides down into his shirt pocket. And he's like, okay. So they get back to the road and continue on until after a little less than 10 days total of riding, they spot a distinct, vaguely pyramidal glacial rock near the road and a lone tree leaning over it with its roots suspended like half out of the ground. This is the landmark where they're supposed to meet up with Kuatoa Ba. And as they approach, they hear this tearing sound, the distinctive sound of an invisibility cloak decloaking. And a large Kuatoa materializes, and I mean a large-sized KT, like 10 feet tall with a mouth big enough to almost swallow Angel whole. Which doesn't make sense, because they've all seen Kuatoa before, and they are medium-sized creatures, like human size, like five and a half foot tall anthropomorphic fish guys with pot bellies. And this guy is way too big and looks very angry. And that's when everything goes to hell. Next time on Tales from My D&D Campaign. If you have any questions, suggestions, or criticism, you can make a post on the forums or leave a comment below. And hit subscribe so you don't miss an installment of Tales from My D&D Campaign. Imagine insulting the feminine, feminine glasses such as myself. myself.